Christina McInerney, you are leader of Britain's biggest trade union. You represent hundreds of thousands of workers in the NHS, uh, nurses, paramedics, cleaners, porters, right up to NHS managers. The government have made an offer to your members, to those workers. Should your members accept it? You're asking them right now. So, yeah, we are asking them to accept it. And this is for members who are in, in England, because we've done a deal in Scotland. We've had the strike. It was successful, even though, to be quite honest, we didn't bring out that many members. But we did bring out some very strategic groups like um, ambulance sector and a few hospital areas. That finally forced the government to come back and make us an offer. Now, it might not be what everyone wants, but we felt it was enough to be actually go out and consult members on. So it's worth, they had £1,400 given last year, uh, of this current year, and the additional money is worth between uh, £1,600 and about £3,000 up to the top. So taken with the £1,400, that's, we think, a reason, you know, significant amount of money this year. And then it's uh, 5%, a bit more for some categories, for 23 to, sorry, 23, 24. We think there is, there is enough here to go out and say to the, the to our, you know, the people who, who are members of Unison, who, you know, as you said, are the cleaners, the nurses, the paramedics, the occupational therapists, all, all the groups that we cover, that actually it will be their decision whether they accept it or not. So we're out, we're out for consultation just now. We'll have the result by the middle of April. If they accept it, that's the deal that's done. If they don't accept it, then um, we've paused our strikes so we would restart them. So if, if your members don't accept the pay offer, you recommend that they do. Some people will say it's not enough. What do you say to those people actually who say don't vote for this deal? I can understand why people are unhappy about it. It's not what we, we'd hoped for a, more, but you know, we are where we are. But I also think there's a lot of armchair warriors out there. People who like to tell those who actually did take strike action and who campaigned for this and who lost money when they took strike action. There's a lot of people like to sit and give them advice saying, just keep on taking the strike action and everything will be fine, which is easy to do when you're kind of a spectator on the side. But if you're actually the ones that came out on strike or you're, in, you're the ones who were campaigning even for strike action and making all the noise within your hospital trust or health trust, um, I think it's for them to decide, quite frankly, rather than, you know, some of the other people who want to give them advice. So you're optimistic or in your ideal world, a further round of strikes would not be necessary because the deal, the offer will be accepted. Well, that's what we're, that's what our, and it's our senior, so we call them lay members, it's the senior group within our health team who take the decision whether to make a recommendation or not. And they took a decision that they can recommend acceptance because they feel there is enough in this offer to actually go out and say to members, you've got a clear choice now. This is the offer from the government. We're recommending you accept it because we don't think we can get any more through negotiations. Uh, but they, they could also reject it. So two years ago, you become the leader of uh, the biggest union in Britain. You're the first woman to lead that union. Why has it taken so long? Well, there's, there's not a high turnover in general secretaries. <laughs> so Unison is 30 years old this year and I'm the fourth general secretary. So, you know, the three previous ones were men. It's not something that happens very often. My predecessor successfully ran uh, three times to be general secretary and members voted for him. You were elected for a five year term. so. You know, it's just one of these things. Were you, as you worked your way up um, to the position, as you were, you held various positions in, in the union, were you ever subject to misogyny or sexism in your union? Not so much in the union as in from people within the union, but I, my background is as, an, as a negotiator. And, uh, you know, 25 years ago, I was often the only woman in the room, and that included the employers I was negotiating with and other unions that you were negotiating with. And so, yeah, of course, you get an element of misogyny, sexism, a bit of harassment thrown in. But I have to say, not really within my organisation. And I think that's partly about setting the tone from the top and 
uh, you know, Dave Prentice, who was my predecessor, I think was very good at that, at setting a tone of that kind of behaviour just won't be tolerated. So fortunately, uh, I haven't experienced direct sort of um, harassment or uh, sex, well, an element of sexism goes everywhere, doesn't it? You, as a woman, you, you experience it everywhere. I'm not, I'm not trying to say we never have sexism within the union, of course we do, but obviously external organisations, I can't, I can't be accountable for them. I mean, your union, like so many others, is a major donor to the Labour Party. What do members get for their cash? Yeah, it's a good question and one that we, we do ask ourselves, I have to say. Um, I'm very proud of the fact that we're part of the Labour movement and I feel there is that intrinsic link between the, the Labour movement and the Labour Party and the trade union movement. And so I'm glad that my union is, is affiliated to the Labour Party and that we give them money because it's the only show in town, really. Um, and, you know, I certainly want a government in Westminster who will see unions as partners they can work with in trying to resolve the serious issues we've got in society at the moment. And I think the only government that I can see that will do this for us would be a Labour government. And I also think, and again, I've been a negotiator through Tory governments and through Labour governments. And in my experience, whilst you don't always agree with them, you can certainly have an open and honest discussion with them. Whereas for years, the Conservatives just won't talk to us on a whole range of issues. They, they just refuse to talk to trade unions, or certainly to our union. Have you had any good relationships with um, Conservative well, sectors of state? Good's maybe too strong a word. I've had relationships, as in working relationships, that you can you can you can have a proper conversation with them. They'll listen to you. Uh, you know, I was head of health for a number of years. Before that, I was head of our education sector, and. Um, in the health team, I took over just as Andrew Lansley became Secretary of State. So I've had a relationship and met every Secretary of State since Andrew Lansley, uh, Health Secretary of State, apart from Therese Coffey. Because okay, that was brief. That was brief. <laughs> that was um, under the, the brief list, <laughs> list trust premiership. And yeah, of course you can. I mean, I'll, we'll, I'll work with anyone. Um, there's certain politicians that you find more difficult than others because they just won't listen you know, that, that they're looking over your shoulder all the time because they're trying to see who's more important or they, they're they doing it because it's a tick box exercise, you know. Oh, I met with the union's tick without having actually achieved anything or having a proper discussion with you. Do you think the Labour Party ever does a bit of that with the unions? Um, sort of would prefer not to shout about its relationship with the union <laughs> for fear that the accusations are that they're in the, 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 the pockets of the unions. That's an allegation that the Tories sometimes make. I can see why some people might feel a bit nervous about that, but I think the tide has turned in this country and that actually people see the value of trade unions. I, my, I would say to the Labour Party, don't be afraid. I've been seen to be close to the, to the trade union movement. Actually, I can't. there's not a single union that I know who wants to do down business or the employers that they work with, because who wants that? Nobody wants the, the business that their members are in to fail. You want it to succeed. And if only governments would realise that, that actually we're the ones who also want businesses and organisations and public services to succeed, and we will do what we can to make that happen, because that's what our members want. The people who are members of unions, whether you're in the private sector, working in you know, a car factory or whether you're working in a school, you want your school to be successful. You want the car factory to be successful and trade unions have a part to play in that. And when the critics of unions say, people like you, you're union barons, you get paid huge salaries, you get these incredible perks, you're not on the side of the workers. <laughs> How do you respond? As a general secretary, I'm paid well. My salary's in the public domain. I get a car. I think that's about it in terms of perks. <laughs> I think the, go the, the, the media like a stereotype. It, it's you don't really match you. it, really. They're often, <laughs> they're often blokes. But the number of times I'm told, you know, oh, so-and-so, uh, you know, he's, he's a union man and he did this and he did that. And I think, yeah, that's great. And, it's, you know, some of my colleagues in the other unions are great at speaking up and fighting for their members. I don't mean that. But um, I think there's a kind of tendency to think either we're not effective leaders because we're women, because perhaps we don't operate in the same way. We're a bit more, uh, restrained's not the right word, but we're, uh, we don't sound the same, we don't look the same. Uh, so I think 
sometimes people are stuck in the 70s and unions are often accused of that, but actually it's not us that's stuck in the 70s. It's often Tory politicians and right-wing commentators who are stuck with the language of the 70s, accusing us of doing all sorts of things that we don't. And I think they find it difficult to deal with somebody like me or the other women leaders that I, that I negotiate with. Final question. What do trade union general secretaries do for fun? Me, personally, so I, I like music. I like the opera. Uh, and, and I don't see why, as somebody from a working class background, I shouldn't like the opera. It's something I've come to fairly late in life, but I have to say I do like it. I also like to read and I like detective novels. Um, I like to cook and I like to walk. So those are um, nothing very exciting, I'm afraid. <laughs> Pretty much like anybody else then. <laughs> I would like to be able to tell you, you know, that I play some exotic <laughs> instrument in my spare time, but I don't. <laughs> Christina McInerney, General Secretary of Unison, Britain's biggest trade union. Thank you for giving us insight into your world. Thank, Thank you. you.